So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Alan Davenport, who talks to us today about play in pre-primary and why we should take play seriously. Uh, Alan is the Professional Learning and Development Manager for the Southeast Asian region at Cambridge University Press and Assessment. And his special interest is early education. So over to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Justina. And thank you, like I said, to everybody from all around the world giving me your time today. Um, I've got a lot to share with you. Just a warning, this is something that I am very passionate about. I, um, you know, I, I, I really love developmental approaches to education. And I, there, there are two main periods in any educator, or any, any learner's life that I really like to focus on. One is the transition from high school to college. I think that there's a lot that goes on there. But the second one that just really gets me energetic and that I love talking about are the developmental milestones that happen to our very young learners. And I, I just, I'm so happy that I've got so many people joining today. But this is very near and dear to my heart because I think that I don't need to convince people around the world that for this age group, for very young learners, that play is something we want in our classroom. I, I think that if I asked most teachers around the world, is play a good thing? They'd say yes. But what I really want to look at today is why play is important. And as Justina said, why we should take it seriously. So I have an agenda for us. And it's going to be going kind of deep into what we mean when we talk about play. Are we sure that we're talking about the same thing when we use the word play? Then I want to make the case, hopefully, of why we should take it seriously. And then at the end, show how we can bring it very practically into our very young learner classes. Some of this stuff, especially at the beginning, is going to be somewhat theoretical. And I do not apologize for that. Because one of the things that I think is our job when we teach this age of, of learner is to make sure that we're justifying what we're doing, that, that we can make parents understand what's happening in our classes and why we're choosing the techniques or, or the, the methods or, or the, just, just the general way that we teach that we do. And that it's not just some crazy idea that we're babysitting and just trying to teach them some English a little bit, but there is a method to what sometimes feels like our madness with very young learners. So some of this stuff you may already know or you may have learned about, you know, when you were studying education, but I think it's very important for us to understand it, not just for ourselves, but so that we can justify our role and why what we do is so important in, in the development and the foundational level of education for children. So that's what I hope to get through today. First, I wanted to start with basically, what is play? Well, I made some predictions. For those of you who are watching on the video or for those of you who joined right when we started, I opened up the room about 10 minutes early and I asked our early arrivals to share with us what are some words that they would expect to see in the definition of play. Now, I haven't looked at it for a while, um, our word cloud, but I'm going to tell you what I might expect to see. I, I wonder if I'm going to see the words fun or imagination or active and interactive or relaxing, positive or reward, or maybe I think Maybe someone will say something about the idea of free or freedom or that there's freedom of choice or something like that. If you like, while we're looking at the word cloud, let me know some more words that you associate with play in the chat box. Go ahead and put it in the chat box. Let's be interactive. Let's, let's uh, share it with everyone. But I want to show you what you guys said with the word cloud. Let's see if I was right. We should be able to see the word cloud right now. Words in the definition of play. 
Oh, I like this. Fun is right there, right at the top. Absolutely. Joy, play, engagement, activity, being someone else. I really like that. There's, you know, that's, that's very social constructivist of whoever said that, that this idea of play is, is not just pretending, but we're, we're, we're being somebody else. We're inhabiting a role. I love that. Having fun and learning together, laughter and fun, imagination, hands-on and fun. Um, we, we can see a lot of things in there. Expressing in our own way. That one I like as well. Expressing in our own way that there's a, there's a personal aspect to play. Thank you all so much for participating with that. I just wanted to know where we were at with our definitions of play. And again, in the chat box, if there's some more that you want to add to what the definition of play is, feel free to chat along. We'd love to see what you have to say. It's hard to find a definition of play. You know, if we really look at what is play, of course, we have theorists. I, I tend to start with Vygotsky. And the reason why I start with Vygotsky is because I think his quotes and his writing on, on why children play and, and what the benefits are, they're kind of what made the light bulb go off um, for me when I was learning about play in itself and how children learn through play. Now, play was very specific to Vygotsky. He had a very, I don't want to say narrow, but he had a very defined view of play said that, you know, play is when children create an imaginary situation or when they're involved with changing the meaning of objects and actions, how if they're riding around on a broom, the broom becomes a horse or the role plays that they do when they're, when they're playing tea at a tea party and they're drinking invisible tea, but it's, it's real to them. That was his idea of play. Some other ideas of play, um, just some that, that, that come to mind. Bergen said, you know, play, if we're talking about what is play, play must be fun. It has to give us internal control. It has to express intrinsic motivation, a motivation from inside of us and internal reality, what's real to us. So that's another way of looking at play. Another one from the same year from Gray. Play is the self-directed and self-chosen activity of children. It is intrinsically motivating. It is organized through rules. And I think that that's one of the things that we, we forget about the definition of play. I certainly do, that there are rules. The rules can be flexible, but there's rules and roles that are involved in play. It includes imagination. It's not always imagination, but it includes imagination. And instead of saying fun, I like how they put it. It is not stressful. And then coming up even in 2014, White and Reese here, play combines intimacy and communication, that there's a social aspect to play, makes use of props and toys, and usually involves more than one player. I'm just wondering uh, in the chat box, if you can type V, B, G, or W, I'm wondering, and you can choose more than one. Do you like all of these definitions? Is there one that you kind of like the description of play about a little bit more than the others? Let me know in the chat box. I want to see a couple of answers. Do any of these kind of go, ah, I like that one to you? I see Christina who likes the G and W. Yeah, the gray one and the white grease, the the that's there. G, you know, the self-directed, self-chosen act of Nichols also says, thank you so much, Kate Nichols. Um, WNR Valentina. Oh, poor Vygotsky is getting left off. You know, Vygotsky, like I said, will always have a special place in my heart. He may come up again. In, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. He'll always have a special, but we might see a quote from him again in the session. All of these, though, are kind of more descriptions of play. They're not really textbook definitions. And I really like what Rag has to say about that. Mike Rag, when he was uh, talking about in, in, in his research or as his argument that he was making, saying, you know, how much intervention should we have in play that maybe we need to be a little bit more hands off in play. This was a, a wonderful article that he wrote in the European Early Childhood Education Research Journal. But he said, maybe we're wasting our time a little bit too much trying to put a definition on it because play is an innate 
primal, biological, pre-conscious drive. We don't think about it. We do it. Which, by its very nature, proceeds without such confining frameworks or structures. You know, why, why try to put a framework around it? We know it when we see it. It's going to happen. Play happens. It's natural, Hannah. You, I've got it right. So, so you know, maybe the descriptions of play are enough. You know, maybe it is that we, we, we have this intuitive idea of what play is without having to spend a lot of time saying, is this exactly play or is this not exactly play? How serious do we get when we come with a definition of play? I do think we need to take play seriously. I don't know if we need to be too serious with our definition of play. What I do know, though, is that we have somewhat of what I like to call an adult problem when it comes to play. The adult problem involves the way that we as adults kind of view or use the word play and how that might be different with the type of play that we're talking about with children. And I have four examples of things that I think will not sound foreign to us. They're, 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 they're probably sentences we've heard or maybe even said, but I think that there's a little bit of a problem with each of them. The first one, don't play with your food. I think there's a problem with A because, you know, we're, we, you know, we say we're, we're here because we believe that play is important. We want to take it seriously. But then sometimes we say, don't play to the children. Don't do that. Don't play. You know, take it. it is. Oh. So are we giving sometimes some mixed messages there? You know, maybe we need to say, don't, don't move your food around on your plate. Eat it. But, you know, we say, but you no, know, we say, don't play with your food. It's not for playing. Or B, which I've heard when I've observed classes, after we do our work, then we will have some time to play. And I think that there's a problem with that one as well a little bit, that, that play is the reward, that play is something that, you know, it's, it's something that we get, how can I put it, something that we get, you know, a relief from something and that the play is after the hard work. But sometimes play itself can be hard work. How about C here? Schools should focus on learning, not playing. I don't think you guys, if you've came to this webinar, if you're watching on the, the, the YouTube repeat, that you would probably agree with this. But I, I know that people sometimes feel this and we have to justify why schools need playing as part of learning. And D, I'll leave it up to you. I'm going to ask, what do you think's wrong with D? If somebody says like, Psh! oh, what about that? Psh! It's child's play. Any ideas why that might be a little bit, you know, of a, of, a, of a wrong thinking from an adult perspective of play? I'll give you just about 20 seconds to write something in the chat box. Yeah, play is not always easy. I, I, I like it. It's patronizing. Absolutely. Um, I, I, child's play. We just dismiss it like it's oh anything that a child can do. Pshuh, pshuh, so easy. But like I said, really similar to B, play can be hard work. In fact, you know, when we look at what we think about play now, I think it's good to look at where we've come from with the theories of play. Now, I'm going to show you four classical theories of play. You know, um, and this is really focusing on childhood play and, and, and when adults from this classical period kind of looked at play and tried to say what's happening with the child and what's going on. And these are classical, which is a nice way of saying they're older. They're not our current thinking, but it's really important to understand them, I think, even though we kind of don't believe them anymore, because a lot of what we do think about play right now kind of were built from these theories. So I think we owe them a lot of respect, even if we don't agree with them or, or they've been kind of discounted a little bit nowadays. The first one, if you look at classical theories of play, is surplus energy. Children play because they have too much energy, so they have to go play and to let off steam. And we thought that for a while, and maybe sometimes we feel that themselves. You know, maybe, maybe if we're teaching kids and we're having a bad day, we want them to run around in the play playground so that they'll take a longer nap during nap time. Because if there's one thing I learned from teaching four-year-olds, nap time is not really for the students, it's for the teacher. But the opposite of that 
Another classical theory is that it was relaxation or recreation. It's not that they had too much energy, that play was the way that children recharged their batteries, that, you know, after the exhausting time of learning, that play builds us back up. And again, it's easy to think why we might think that, but it's not really where we're at with our thinking of play nowadays. There's a theory that play is practice. And it doesn't mean practice like role play for adult roles. What they meant by this practice theory is practice for survival, that play develops our senses and, you know, our, our touch and our taste. And we're, we're growing into, to, you know, to, to be humans and our survival instinct and play is linked to that. And another one, which I really think is interesting is the recapitulation theory of play, which says, Hey, play, it takes us through the evolutionary process of being a human. When we, when we start to play, we're going through the cultural development that our generations have done. When we play, we go through being hunters and gatherers and, and, you know, we, and through this primal, this, this basic person into, into a developed cultural character and play takes us through that. And I think all of these are interesting but it's not exactly where we're at with play now. If we look at more modern theories of play, and again, I think this is important for us, not just to know as teachers, but to be able to explain to parents and sometimes to our administrators and other teachers who don't teach very young learners, you know, our secondary teachers, why we need to do so much play. When we look at the contemporary or modern theories, there's lots of different kinds, and I don't have time to go through all of them. Um, you would be very bored if I did, but do Google contemporary theories of play, and you'll see that they tend to be developmental. And by developmental, I mean um, the, the cognitive development, some, some a person you might associate with as Piaget, um, or even a socio-pragmatic development, a sociocultural development, the Vygotsky type of social constructivist development. So they tend to be about that. Bruner, I see in the chat, what about Bruner? Bruner would consider himself, I think, a social constructivist, that with uh, scaffolding kind of going on from the works of, of Lev Vygotsky. Developmental, though, in that it is a constructive process to Bruner. Um, so great question there, Christina. Or they tend to be ecological, which talks about the environment that play exists in. And, and I'll talk about building the environment as well. I tend to be more of a developmentalist. That doesn't mean that it's right or that it's wrong. It's controversial. You know, I can't, I can't honestly say play is definitely developmental, um, but that's where I tend to go. But there's, there's a lot to be said about ecological views of play, setting up the right environment to make play happen as well. When we look at the theorists, there's lots of different types of play that are identified, and it depends on the theorist. And again, I hope I'm giving you enough to say, hmm, I didn't realize there's so much out there, but maybe I want to do my own research and get involved in, in looking at what this means. There's physical, intellectual, social, emotional, solitary, imaginary, symbolic, functional, constructive, dramatic. The list goes on and on and on. And I don't think it's important that we identify all the different types of play in this webinar, but I think what's interesting is although theorists kind of agree we can't come up with a definition of play, we sure do like to classify it. Now, I'm going to show you a different way of classifying it later on, but just keep this in mind that, you know, depending on the theorist, you know, there's lots of different types of play that's identified, and I think all of them have value. Play isn't just a thing. It's comprised of many different types of play. Play, though, I think everyone would agree that play is non-serious. You know, when we're playing doctor, we're not trying to cure a disease for real. We're just having fun. It's not serious. Play tends to be self-selective and usually involves intrinsic motivation. There's something there's something internal that we like about it. You know, there's, there's, there's something that gives us a joy from within. We don't like it because we've been coerced. We like it because something, again, innate and within us makes us like it. Play is low risk. And that's, I, I don't mean that, that children never get hurt in play. I just mean that there, nothing is real. There are no boundaries uh, to play. 
Um, there's no consequences really, uh, to, to, for example, to losing. Um, maybe we feel a little bit bad, but the consequences aren't so serious. It's related to play being non-serious, but I think they're two different things here. And another one that's kind of similar, but a wee bit different, is that play is safe. And again, I don't mean that children never get hurt in play, that they never fall down and, 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 and skin their knee or, 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 you know, start crying and we have to, you know, get the nurse and everything. But what I mean by safe, again, is that there are freedom to fail, but there's also freedom to succeed and freedom to innovate. You know, that there's they're, that they're encouraged to discover that there's more than one way of doing things and 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 that, that they again, they have the freedom to be themselves. So I think when I'm talking about play in this webinar, I, I tend to think of it that way. But if you only remember one thing from me, I would want to say that over and over again, contemporary theorists either directly in their writing or anecdotally from, from being quoted. Um, and and I, I couldn't find direct quotes, but even famous people that we respect nowadays tend to come up with a consensus that teachers should remember that play is their work. The play is not separate from work when it comes to being a child. Play is the work of the child. Three quotes, possibly, you know, Maria Montessori uh, is, is, attributed to a quote, play is the work of the child. Um, Jean Paget, if, 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 you, if you like a more constructivist approach, play is a child, playing is a child's job, he said. And even Lev Vygotsky, who has that little more narrowed view of play, I just couldn't resist putting this quote in. And even though I think play is a little bit broader now than what Vygotsky said, I think that, you know, this this quote, a child's greatest achievements are possible in play, achievements that tomorrow will become her basic level of real action. Child's greatest achievements are possible in play, not their greatest ability to have fun. A child's greatest achievements are possible in play, achievements that tomorrow will become her basic level of real action. And my number one favorite one, the one that was in the abstract from this webinar, from Fred Rogers, a, a television, a children's television host that I watched growing up, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, um, but really knew his stuff and really made sure that, that his television show was cutting edge and very developmentally appropriate at the time, you know, says basically the same thing, but says it in a way that just touches my heart. Play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of the child, of childhood. All right, we've made it through the theory. I hope that I've convinced you a little bit or, or at least given you a, a story that you can tell and explain and show to other people who need convincing that play needs to be taken seriously. Play is the work of the child, but what does that work do? What's the outcome? Well, play supports the development of linguistic skills. We can bring in play through stories. Now, just reading a story may not be play, but what we do with the story is play. And I love it. I, I see Kate just wrote in the chat, play is experimental and risk-taking. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could not agree anymore. And, and that's what we want with children, isn't it? I mean, you, you know, yeah, I, again, don't get me started. I've, I've got limited time, but I could go on about risk-taking for another hour, I think, about how it's important to take those risks and to remember that risk-taking is going to sometimes be failure-prone. Otherwise, it would be called sure thing-taking. But what do we learn from those risks and how do we celebrate the risk that happens, the process through play? I love it. But supporting the development of linguistic skills. We're here because, you know, most of us are English teachers. So through stories and the play that we can do with stories, the acting out, role-playing and 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 uh, using, drawing things with the characters and using masks and becoming the characters. That can actually be play and help us develop our, ling our linguistic skills. Rhymes and chants and songs. Again, just put, pushing play on a CD player may not be play, but what do we do with our songs? When we bring in the movement, when we change the words, when we have fun, that's a form of play. And puppets. 
Puppets are a great way to bring in play or a playful element into the classroom with this age group. I say this because yes, games are play, but play is bigger than just games. Games is a subset of play, but play includes so much more. And all of these things can help support the development of linguistic skills. But one of the things, and I see from Justina exploring their boundaries in a safe way, again, Justina could not agree more. But what we also are, are coming to realize is that play supports the development of life competencies. And there's a wonderful paper uh, from Cambridge called Developing Life Skills Through Play. And if you're okay, I would like to make it available to you for free. Um, are, are you okay with free things? If you are, let me know in the chat box if, if, if you'd like it. Um, can, can you just say, uh, I, I, I'd like it, please? Um, and if you're watching on the YouTube, I think we'll, we'll try to have a link down there. You said, yes, please, Alexander. That was so polite. I'd like this, please. Okay. Um, Justina's going to share it with you because we want you to have it. But what we see in this and what I really want you to pay attention to if you, if you download this paper and you get this paper for free is that play, yes, it supports the linguistic development, but it also supports the development of life competencies, especially creative thinking, especially critical thinking and learning to learn and communication at its heart of things. So play has a linguistic element, play has those life skills or what sometimes we call 21st century skills. And I get tired of, of, of people thinking that 21st century skills belong at university and at high school and they're developed in the science class. We can develop these skills and in the pre-primary level, all of them, and we can start doing it by laying those foundations for these things and play is, is a medium where these skills swim. So life skills, 21st century skills, life competencies, whatever you call them, they can be developed through play. Now, I told you I was going to show you kind of a different framework about play, um, where I think that we're at and where I really want you to concentrate if you get this paper, something to keep in mind. That there are different types of play, but one good way to look at play is to put it on this spectrum. In fact, this comes, like I said, from the white paper, which we will share with you. Um, the play spectrum goes from the left with direct instruction all the way to the right with free play. But there's different levels in between. Now, what do we mean by direct instruction or free play or guided play? Well, with direct instruction, you can see in the picture the, the adult is holding the block. The blocks are there and the kids kind of like, what? Direct instruction. It's what happens a lot in our classrooms. The adult is initiating and leading the activity. The adult directs, whereas the child is in the passive role. There is time for direct in instruction in a classroom. Absolutely. But I think we have to make sure that we're working on a balance, that we're not defaulting to direct instruction. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, over on the green side, we have free play, where the child is initiating and leading the activity. And there's no influence from an adult whatsoever. The child decides what he or she wants to play with. They, they decide who they're going to play with. They decide how they're going to play. This is, this is the freest end of things. So we have these two extremes. And in the middle is where I think a lot of the magic happens. And it doesn't always have to be 50% in the middle, 50-50. You know, again, this is a spectrum. But in between 0 and 100, we have something called guided play. In guided play, the adult initiates while the child leads the activity. And guided play includes an interaction between an adult who supports children's learning by asking questions, introducing new concepts. However, the autonomy stays with the child. And I really would like to see us, if we're going to look at from theory to practice, us bringing a lot more guided play into our lessons. So how do I uh, bring all of this theory to practice? What is it that we need to be doing if we, if we don't want to just talk about the theory of play, but how do we make it happen in the classroom? Well, 
Before I tell you that, it has to be acknowledged that there's not a whole lot of research about this. And sometimes the research is contradictory. So I can't give you all the, the, the definites. Do this. We know this works. As, as much as we've been talking about play since the 1800s with our, with our child psychology and, and educational theorists, we're still lacking on a lot of research. However, there is enough evidence to suggest that play helps with early literacy development, which I'm passionate about. Language development, especially vocabulary, which somebody mentioned in the chat box earlier. Absolutely, you've done your reading as well. And the development of life competencies. And again, outlined in that white paper is, is a lot that, that can go to support this. Do we know for sure? I can't say evidence proves, but there's enough evidence to strongly suggest it. And yet play still tends to be thought of as different from learning. And teacher-led activities still tend to be overused in the pre-primary classroom. And sometimes this is understandable. And by that, I mean sometimes we're being observed. Sometimes there are expectations of parents. Sometimes we're put into situations like during the pandemic where we're learning online remote teaching. And we just think, what do I have to do? It has to be very teacher-led. It's sometimes out of our control. I'm not saying you're a bad teacher if you do it. But these teacher-led activities, sometimes they're used when we could turn it over to the child a little bit faster. So just something to keep in mind. But what I really, like I said, want to make clear is it's not different from the learning process. It's not a different from the learning process, as I put, a different way of learning. The teacher has a role in play. As guided play seems to be tied to better learning outcomes than totally free play. And again, can I prove it? No, but there's lots and lots of research that does support this. Again, look at that white paper. It's why I wanted you to have copies of it so that, you know, I'm not making this up. But guided play seems to be tied to better learning outcomes, especially with life competencies, than totally free play. And there's some research that's outlined in that white paper that supports that. Now, having said that, free play also has its benefits. We shouldn't totally give up on free play especially when the use of English is encouraged. For example, maybe you have in your classroom an English center or, you know, where in free time, children are allowed to choose to play in it if they want, but part of that play involves using English. Or maybe you have a class puppet and you, you let the children play with a puppet. But one of the rules that I had with puppets in my class was, you know, the puppet only knows English. So if they put the puppet on, they're going to be forced to use English because the puppet speaks English. The puppet doesn't know the local language. So all of those things. So how do we do it then? How do we bring play into our lessons? Great question. We've got to be practical. And I think I have enough time, 15 minutes to show you. So I'm going to use examples from Pippa and Pop. It's one of our, our, our well, it's our newest course for, for pre-primary at, at, at the time of this recording. and. It has a strong, strong link to play. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this course just because I think it's going to revolutionize, you know, how, how we approach the teaching and learning in the classroom. Having said that, I do want to remind you that even though I work for a publisher and we, 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 we do love it, you know, if you use our books, a book is to support your lesson, not the other way around. We want you to teach your students English, and hopefully the book helps you do that. We don't want you to teach your students the book. And there's a lot to be done in a class before the book gets opened, and there's lots to do after it is closed. The book is part of the lesson. The book is not always the whole lesson. And that's why at Cambridge, I don't even like to really say that we, we make books as much as we make courses, and we help uh, teachers, you know, with, with a, a strong linked series of lessons and, 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 and a, a methodology that works more than, than exactly the picture on the page. Which is why instead of showing you lots of things from the student's book, in this webinar, I wanna show you lots of things from the teacher's book. Because the teacher's book, at least in my region, tends not to be used as much or to, to be exploited as much as it could do. Now, I am not saying that you have to teach the way the teacher's book says. 
But I also really want to encourage you to always look at the teacher's book, look at what was suggested to do before, during, and after a lesson. And if you choose to do something different, great, you're the teacher, you're in control, but at least use it to get an understanding of, of what's going on on the page. Because without it, some of the pages might just look like, listen and put a sticker on, okay? Um, we listened and put a sticker on, finished, okay, let's play a game. No, there's way much more to a lesson than that. Let me give you an example. On the right, we have a page of the student's book. Listen, point, stick, and say. You know, if I just follow those directions, it would last all of six minutes, maybe. But if I look at the teacher's book, and I want to show you parts of the teacher's book that I think is amazing. Um, we have our lesson objectives. We have language. We also have materials. And I, I do want to point out that the materials are important to this. Notice it says, ask children to bring toy animals or, or dolls or monsters to the class. That's going to come back later. And you're going to see why that's part of the material. Some of the, the toys that children were asked to bring in on their own, or if they, if we're teaching remotely, you know, go get a toy, go get one of your toys and we can use it through the screen just because the medium has changed and we're teaching online instead of in a classroom doesn't mean that we can't play. We can still play through our screens. And then we can see some of the things that it says to do before the book. Let me just move this that way. Have children call and greet Pippa. Pippa is our puppet. Say hello, Pippa. Say hello, Pippa. Oh. Pippa. Are you happy to be here? Pippa's happy to be here. Do you like Pippa? Pippa likes you. Everybody say hi, Pippa, in the chat box. I think Pippa's going to try to read. Yeah, oh, Christina says hi, Pippa. Are you happy that Christina said hi to you, Pippa? Oh, Pippa's so happy. Look at that. All right, fantastic. Now, what are we doing with Pippa here? We're, we're demonstrating some things, you know, choose one of the body parts, uh, flashcards. Pippa is his neck. Where's your neck? And have Pippa, you know, talk about the, 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 the neck, you know, point to the neck. And then Pippa sees the two monsters and she gets scared. We say, don't worry, don't worry, Pippa. They're pictures. Oh, and she, and she relaxes there. Yeah, that's good. And then we can ask our questions and we can go and we can, we can do the lesson. But what I like about this lesson as well like I said, there's before the book, there's after the book. But if I look at finishing the class, there's a part of the teacher's book after the class, after the book is closed, learning through play, differences. Ask the children to take out their toys. Allow them time to go around and show their toys to other children. Ask the children to stand in a circle with their toys. Say, two eyes. And the children who have two eyes, they hold them up and they spin around. And then maybe we repeat with other parts of the body so that they're engaging with their toy and they're spinning around when they, when they get that linguistic thing. And then what do we do after that? After we've demonstrated, we encourage children to lead the activity. Alexander, you say, love it, great activity. It is, and it's play. And are we reviewing the body parts? Absolutely, but I think it's play. Can you let me know in the chat box though, really quickly? I know some of you have to type quickly. Um, why is it play though? What aspects of play can we see? You don't have to give me a long answer, but we asked for words that we liked uh, in play. Why is this play? What are some of those words we used in our definition of play that this is? Let me know in the chat box. They're involved, absolutely, and that was in there. Um, they're, they're active, it's fun, it's creative, it's spontaneous. Children get to choose. It involves toys. Children can lead in it. This is play. And what are they learning? I'm going to go ahead and, and Michael Tomlinson says interaction. Nice to see you, Michael. Thanks for, thanks for joining us here. Uh, Michael Tomlinson, one of the authors of Pippa and Pop, everyone. So, I mean, whoa, I got to really step it up now, don't I? But what are they learning with this? You know, of course, they're learning uh, you know, to, to review the body parts, but they're, they're also learning some interaction. They're learning to listen. They're learning the rules of the game. What do you think? Is this guided or free play? Would you consider this, if we looked on that spectrum, guided or free? Guided, says Valentina right away. Um, it's guided, started out. It could, it could gradually go into free, but it starts out guided. Yeah. 
This is what we mean by teacher led, teacher initiated, but the children still have autonomy. Is there any chance to hand over? And by hand over, I mean, is there any chance to start moving it down the spectrum further towards free play? What do you think? Yes or no? Sure, says Alexander. Yes, says somebody else in the chat box. Yeah, I, I see it. Remember, if you want everyone to see, you can type to everyone. Hosts and panelists go to be. But yes, and this is the way that that guided play can gradually become free play. You know, we we know we've succeeded when it's their free time and they're playing this game again and they're saying two eyes and they're spinning around by themselves. It's fun now. What happens though, and I'm going to wait for an answer in the chat box. What happens though, if you have a student who spins around at the wrong time? You know, you say two eyes and they have a monster that has four eyes, but they still spin around. Do we say, wait, you're wrong. You shouldn't have spun around. What, 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 what are some just suggestions? Let me know in the, the chat box. What should we do in that case? <laughs> Kate says, of course, not. of course, I took it to the. Yeah, maybe redirecting his attention also in a very playful way. You silly, you have four eyes. You spun around it too. Let's count the eyes. And we, again, we want to make it safe. We want, or sometimes maybe we just let it go. Or maybe we say, let's count your eyes. One, two, three, four. Now you spin and we get it. Again, it's not. Okay, play can be in this way some sort of assessment, but we don't want to say you're wrong, you're doing this. We want to keep it light, we want to keep it safe. It's not the end of the world if they spin around at the wrong time. It doesn't mean that they're never going to understand the difference between two eyes and four eyes. It just means maybe we go back to guiding a little bit more and maybe we, we, um, yeah, exactly as Hannah said, guide them nicely, give them some directions, but everything is nice. We don't want to take the fun away from it because they were wrong. There are fun ways to say, you, you silly, you're going to spin around and everything. He just wants to spin. Let's all, let's all, let's all, let's all spin. And then we say, now you have four eyes. So I'm going to say four eyes. And then we let him spin. And then, and then we say two eyes again, and we see if he spins. And again, if, if it, if, if it's really a problem, then we go back in the book and we reteach and we look at the stickers and we, we do that sort of thing. Play should remain play and they're still learning. And, you know, take the, take the guidance from how children correct each other. You know, hey, you got to, uh, you know, they'll, they'll do it themselves. Um, kids learn, I see kids learn to fear mistakes very early on and it sticks and it worries me a lot. I absolutely agree with that. Mistakes are going to happen. Mistakes are a sign of learning. This is off topic, but I think I have time. You know, mistakes are wonderful sometimes with our, our kids. I remember one time when I was teaching in my kindergarten class, I, I had a student and I always did these routines and I say, what, what do you want to do at the weekend? And, you know, they'd always tell me what their favorite thing was. And he always said, football, every single time he said, football, you know, you could depend on it. Somebody else would, you know, you know, they'd say, oh, Mr. Allen, give me long answers. Sometimes they'd only give me one word answers. But, but from this kid, I would always get football. And then one day, about three months into it, you know, I said like, and what are you going to do at the weekend? He said, Mr. Allen, I am football. And I thought, great, you made a sentence. I didn't think, oh, that doesn't make sense. So mistakes aren't always just learning from, they're a sign of learning as well. So not all mistakes are the same. We have to be careful, especially in play. Um, for me, what would happen if you have a student who spins around at the wrong time? I'd say, are they just being playful? Are they being silly? Or is this something that maybe later I want to go back and review and add to an aim in the lesson later? Use it as a formative assessment, not a summative assessment that needs to be corrected right then and there. This is another example from the book. This from, comes from our cross-curricular kind of clill sections in Pippa and Pop. This is a lesson about science. Now, again, science at this age. It's, it's about the shadows. What do we do? Well, we're going to darken the room and we're going to take out a torch, um, which always sounds funny to me as an American because a torch to me is always something that's on fire. But here it's the British version of torch. They mean flashlight for Americans. Don't give your students fire. Take it from me. That's good advice. But avoid complete darkness. Some children might be afraid. Ask children to hold up their hands, shine the torch, and we're kind of giving them the ideas of what a shadow is. And then we go through the book and we build some things. So again, remember, we do things before the book, then we use the book, and then we're, we're, they're going to match the shadow to the shape. And then after the book, we hand out torches and 
hey, they hand out paper and pencils and we have them do the same thing with other objects and we explore, shadow's great. But then where does the play come in? Look at this learning through play that comes in next at the end of the class. Darken the room, take out the torch and ask a child to hold it while you make some animal shadows. And in our activity book, we have some examples of how to, to do some animal shadows. Then we hand out the torches so they can make their own animal shadows. And then what happens after that? We call Pippa. And Pippa comes back. Whoa, it's Pippa again. Pippa's so happy to see. And, and, and what happens when we call Pippa? The Children show Pippa some shadows that they can make with their hand. And Pippa goes around and praises the children for their performance and thanks them for teaching them how to make shadows so that they become the teacher in this. I love this. And again, it, this isn't a competitive game, but why is it play? Does anybody in the chat box want to let me know? Why is this play? Again, think of those words we use to describe play. Hopefully it's fun. Yes. It is interaction. Yeah. It is play. We even get to kind of take a teaching mode in. There's a bit of role play in, you know, with the, the, where the student becomes the teacher to, to Pippa in there. Um, but it's just a, a chance. There's, there's freedom of choice. There's exploring. It is play. What are they learning? Um, I'm just going to, I, I spent a little bit time, too much time on my example. So I'm going to kind of go on, you know, they're, they're learning again about shadows, but they're also learning, you know, how to teach, how to explain. Guided or free, this starts out very guided and it could go into free. Any chance for a handover? Absolutely. And why have the students interact with a puppet? I think I've kind of um, already uh, said this here, but it's a chance again for us to do some formative assessment, but a chance for them to get the praise from someone that they appreciate, Pippa, our friend, um, and to explain. Children like to be the teacher. They like to be in control. They like to, you know, or at least my students did. They like to tell you, you know, what they've learned and what, you know, and, and give a chance to, to show off. And that's what it is. Another one with a story about a new cat. And this Story is about getting a new cat and the cat's scared and we have to be nice to the cat. And there's values about, you know, being kind to animals that's related with this story. But the play that comes with this, you know, it asks us to bring materials like stethoscopes, towels, rubber gloves, white shirts, a lot of things. And then we learn through play with a vet's role play because our value is taking care of animals. So let's set up a vet's role play area. Let's join in as the children role play. The children are pretending to be veterinarians taking care of these stuffed animals. And then, you know, depending on your circumstances, you might video the children if you have a closed, safe environment and send it to the, 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 the parents. And Again, I've kind of gone a little bit over time, so I'll say, you know, I, I hope that we understand why role play is play. I don't think we need to really go into that there. But what are they learning? They're, they're expressing the value from the story, but they're also learning interaction. They're learning kindness. They're learning those social values. Is it guided or free? This one is more free. There's not really a chance to hand over because it starts with free play. Remember I said that that guided play, there's a lot of benefit to, but let's not ignore free play. This is a great chance for free play um, related to the story that's, that's there and those values. And again, what should the teacher be doing when they join in? I think since this is free play, the teacher needs to be playing along too. The teacher should be a veterinarian and, and learning from the, the students. That's the reason why this is play and how we can take play seriously in the classroom. I'm not going to read all of these to you, but what I what these are, A, B, C, and D, these are all from the same unit in the course book for Pippa and Pop Level 3. There are four different types of play that are, that are talked about in the teacher's book. And what I want you to see is that there are different levels of the spectrum between guided and free. I think a genuine, uh, like a general idea when I'm looking through Pip and Pop is three of the activities tend to be more guided and one tends to be free. But there are ideas in the teacher's book for play in every single unit that's related to what we learn in the course book, but lets us be the teacher and lets us get all the benefits of learning from play. Whether it's this one right here, learning through play and the sculptures, 
where we just bring in modeling clay and we let them, you give them the freedom to make their sculptures alone without any guidance. That's just about as free as it can get. All the way to learning through play, my favorite activity where we've made three different areas in the class and let them choose what they wanna play, a little bit more teacher led, but autonomy still with the student. Or learning through play, decorating numbers where we can draw a two digit number and they can, they can decorate it and then we can display it. That's a form of play a little bit more teacher led and then absolutely whole class and teacher led musical chairs. So in the same unit, we have four different opportunities to play and four different places on that spectrum. Another thing as well, I just want to point out um, presentation plus if we are doing it digitally, we have games that that can be used for play. Here's an example of a, a vocabulary game that I'm going to show off right now. Um, Guess with Kim. And guess with Kim, um, here's some vocabulary. And I'm going to make this kind of, uh, let me move this out of the way. We have easy, just, just because you all are so great. I'm going to make it a little bit difficult. I'm going to select all the vocabulary. And all we have to do is guess which vocabulary they we're going to see. So I'm going to play it a little bit at the time. And when you think you know what it is, type it in the chat box. Here we go. <gasps> Any idea what it might be? Any idea? Let me know in the chat box. And again, if I'm doing this online, maybe I'm having them yell it out. Any idea? And I already see it right there. We have sandwich. You all are too, you know, you all are, we're, we're too good right there. It was a sandwich. How about this one? Any ideas what this one might be? Water. And I can check. Water. It was water. And, and I can get my points. I can get my reward if I'm playing this as an interactive game. Well done. But I get Pippa and Pop there, Pippa on the right, Pop on the left saying, you know, well done that I can see that it's water. So again, play can be in the class. Play can be digital. Let's not think that because we're doing things online that the methodology or the ideas of play change. The medium changes, but the ideas of the method don't. So that's just an idea um, for, for the presentation. Plus, just wanted to show you briefly that you know there are games that, that come with it as well. And that, of course, is part, part, of, part of play. All right, five minutes left, but I'm gonna go ahead and say my final tips. This is the last slide. One, plan for play. Make sure we remember that it's part of the learning process and not an extra. And even if you don't use Pip and Pop, I hope you do because it is fantastic. That's not my business card speaking. I love this course. Michael, you did a great job. If you're listening, I'm so, so happy with this. But plan for play. You know, think of what you can play, think of how you can play, think of the types of play and put that in your lesson plan. And that will help you justify why it is important and, and tying it into the learning outcomes. That it's not we're doing it for fun or relaxation or a break from learning, but how can I plan for play and make it part of learning? And then also set up English areas where during breaks, free play or recess, learners have the choice to play in English. You know, again, Pippa only speaks English in my classroom. So if they want to play with Pippa, that's their choice but they're going to be using English so that play and English together become available in their free time without it being assigned. Remember that we're, I like to say, environmental engineers. And by that, I mean that we're not just telling students what to do, we're modeling the English and activities. We're creating that environment where it is safe and you know where if the student spins around at the wrong time, we show students how to react to it and that it's okay. And that we let students take over from the teacher-led activities and let them lead following your model. It's what sometimes in the literature called a gradual release of responsibility, which I really believe in for these uh, this age group. Also, communicate with parents about how play is helping their children. Let's get them on board right away. Let's not wait for them to complain and say, you're not teaching them all the phonics and vocabulary that they need to learn. I'm worried about them. We have to go from the beginning and explain the benefits of play. And hopefully, you know, this webinar will help you articulate it, but don't just say play is good. Use the specific examples, bring in it to our explanations. Uh, when it comes with play, play involves sometimes a lot of props. Use all your budget and beg for more. Make the case that this foundational learning is important, that you're not buying games for your classroom. You're buying educational material. You're buying learning developmental tools that are important when you want the budget for that stethoscope. But even if you don't get the budget for it, think of what you have available, not what you are lacking. If you don't have a Pippa puppet, make one out of a sock. If you don't have 
you know, all the things with a stethoscope or things, have them draw pictures about it, have them, have them make it themselves out of pipe cleaners. Kids have a wonderful imagination. Don't think about what we don't have so we can't do it. We have a lot more uh, than we think we do, especially because the children will go with us with their imaginations. So think of what you have available, not what you're lacking. And when in doubt, if you don't know, is this game working or should I give it over to the release or not? One of the biggest tricks I got was trusting your young learners. Sometimes we're afraid to, to ask three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds if they want to continue or do something else. You know, When in doubt, ask your students what to do. They were a lot more helpful in planning lessons or adjusting my lessons on the fly than I think I ever gave them credit for. So when in doubt, ask your students what to do, listen to them. And, and that's a way that it can help us. So thank you very much. Um, it's right at the time. I think we have a time for a couple of questions if we have them in the Q&A box. Um, I, I think we have about four minutes, Justina. Sorry to talk so long, but I am so passionate about this. I care so much about this. And I hope that we have gotten some more about why we should take play seriously. So thank you all very much for your time. And I'll stop sharing now and turn it over to Justina. Thank you, Alan, for such an inspiring session. I feel my inspirational batteries are fully charged now. <laughs> <laughs> I could see the audience enjoying it as well in the chat and, and through the comments. So thank you very much. Um, if you want to explore the topic of play in more detail, of course, you can watch the recording of this webinar next week. And we'll also share the white paper that um, Alan mentioned. Uh, look out for an email uh, from Cambridge University Press and Assessment next week. And um, for those of you who wish to see more examples of the book, you can go to cambridgeone.org and download for free uh, two units of Pippa and Pop. Just look for Pippa and Pop in my library at cambridgeone.org and uh, you can see the games that um, Alan showed and the student book, the teacher's book and the ideas that we looked at today. So um, let's dive into questions. Um, do we have any questions in the Q&A? Um, I can't see any and I wonder whether um, I could maybe throw one from myself, Alan. Yeah, Justina. So, yeah, let's let's chat. Um, this word came up earlier in the webinar, and it was the word game. What, what's the difference between a game and play? Is there any? Oh, yeah, that's a loaded question because there are some people who really believe in game-based learning. There are some people who really believe in bringing in games, but they don't want a game-based classroom. You know, um, so the, the definition of game can vary. And I'm, you know, if I gave one, then somebody who's an expert in game or gamification even would then say, oh, that's not right. That's not right. So it's, it is a loaded question. But to me, a game, it's a little bit more structured. There's usually, you know, some sort of thing that I can see a, a, a cooperative or competitive element to it. Um, there, there's usually a goal that we're trying to achieve, you know, at, at the end result of the game. Um, in many types of games, there are ways to accumulate points or to, to have milestones that happen, you know, that, and, and a lot of times, whether we're playing by ourselves or with a team, there is kind of this ownership of, you know, a win or lose, even in some cooperative games that we play, that there's there's a, a feeling of, you know, oh, I'm succeeding or I'm not. And these are elements that make things game like that you don't get in sorts of play when we're moving along to a song. You know, when we're doing head and shoulders, knees and toes, you don't think, am I winning? You know, so I think that's that's kind of in a nutshell, the, the difference. And that's as far as I want to get into it with games, other than to say, yes, I think we know a game when we see it. And it's not so much of, of you know, is this a game or isn't it? But to just widen our view of play and understand that that a lot of times we don't need more games in our classroom. We need other forms of play in our classroom as well. We need the role play. We need the veterinarian setup instead of always going to game as our default for play. Play is a wide, wide world. Let's not be, let's not limit ourselves um, just by thinking that all get, you know, all play are games. You know, it's not games are play, but not all play is games. Thank you, Alan. And uh, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, and I think that kind of game versus play is just a nice way to wrap up and summarize the session. So, um, um, Oh, 
Well, I don't know. Do we take this one? It seems like an important one from Violetta. Go right ahead. Go when right you ahead. See your Maybe. class become as a chaos. How can you step the game like stop the game nicely? So when when it goes a bit chaotic, how yeah. can you bring it to to a close nicely? I've always said, um, you know, when I started teacher training, you know, for, for very young learners, one of the things that I really wanted to develop, it seemed like people are always asking me, like, what games should I play with my kids? But I always like to do workshops where we talked about coolers and, and getting them, um, you know, settled down. And I think a good teacher at this age group will have twice as many activities to, to calm your kids down. Um, then you do games to get them excited. Now, I think that the way that I used to do it, no matter what I did, you try to look for something that can grab attention, get them all doing the same thing, and then calming down together. Some people like call outs where you have, you know, like if, if I say class, you know, my class knows that they always have to say yes. And so we say class and they say yes. And you say it again and you get one or two students answering and you say class, class, and they say yes, yes. And soon you say class, class, class. And they, they, they all know that, that they're, they're saying yes, yes, yes together. Or, you know, if you can hear my voice, clap one time. If you can hear my voice, clap four times. You know, and then you get them all on the same page. And then, then we say like deep breath in and sit down. But it's about grabbing the attention first and then harnessing that energy. Another thing that I like, you know, is if they are being loud, we start out loud and then we get just a little bit softer and then just a little bit softer and then just a little bit softer. And, you know, let's say, hey, hey, let's say, hey, hey, let's say, hey, hey. And we 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 transition them. There's no way that we're going to play a game and then say, okay, get in your seats and open your book to page seven. You know, we have to transition them into it. And then one, um, I'm going to put in a plug because I stole this one from Karen Elliott, who I think is doing a webinar for us next month. But she has a chant in, in one of her books that I love. Um, that's, uh, you know, put your hands on your head, put your hands on your head. And you wait until everybody does it and they see it. And they just put your hands on your knees, cross your arms and listen, please. And I think it's a great chant and a great physical way, but, you know, calming them down is a process. And the last thing I would say, Justina, is somebody has made a very important point in the chat box. I'm hogging all the things. Pippa also wants to say goodbye to everyone. So, oh, well, it was a real pleasure uh, to host this webinar with you, Alan, and with our lovely Pippa. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in and for being such a lovely um audience. Um, as Alan mentioned, we've got another webinar uh, to close the series on the 7th of April with Karen Elliott. We'll warmly invite you to join us then as well. And um, that's all for now. Thanks ever so much, Alan. And thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.